Chapter Eight of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Eight: A Ride on a Lion the next day glided away pleasantly enough partly in settling myself in my new quarters and partly in strolling round the neighbourhood under arthur's guidance and trying to form a general idea of elveston and its inhabitants when five o'clock arrived arthur proposed without any embarrassment this time to take me with him up to the hall in order that i might make acquaintance with the earl of ainsley who had taken it for the season and renew acquaintance with his daughter lady muriel my first impressions of the gentle dignified and yet genial old man were entirely favourable and the real satisfaction that showed itself on his daughter's face as she met me with the words this is indeed an unlooked-for pleasure was very soothing for whatever remains of personal vanity the failures and disappointments of many long years and much buffeting with a rough world had left in me yet i noted and was glad to note evidence of a far deeper feeling than mere friendly regard in her meeting with arthur though this was as i gathered an almost daily occurrence and the conversation between them in which the earl and i were only occasional sharers had an ease and a spontaneity rarely met with except between very old friends and as i knew that they had not known each other for a longer period than the summer which was now rounding into autumn i felt certain that love and love alone could explain the phenomenon how convenient it would be lady muriel laughingly remarked apropos of my having insisted on saving her the trouble of carrying a cup of tea across the room to the earl if cups of tea had no weight at all then perhaps ladies would sometimes be permitted to carry them for short distances one can easily imagine a situation said arthur where things would necessarily have no weight relatively to each other though each would have its usual weight looked at by itself some desperate paradox said the earl tell us how it could be we shall never guess it well suppose this house just as it is placed a few billion miles above a planet and with nothing else near enough to disturb it of course it falls to the planet hmm? the earl nodded of course though it might take some centuries to do it and is five o'clock tea to be going on all the while said lady muriel that and other things said arthur the inhabitants would live their lives grow up and die and still the house would be falling 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 but now as to the relative weight of things nothing can be heavy you know except by trying to fall and being prevented from doing so you all grant that we all granted that well now if i take this book and hold it out at arm's length of course i feel its weight it is trying to fall and i prevent it and if i let go it falls to the floor but if we were all falling together it couldn't be trying to fall any quicker you know for if i let go what more could it do than fall and as my hand would be falling too at the same rate it would never leave it for that would be to get ahead of it in the race and it could never overtake the falling floor i see it clearly said lady muriel but it makes one dizzy to think of such things how can you make us do it there is a more curious idea yet i ventured to say suppose a cord fastened to the house from below and pulled down by someone on the planet well, then of course the house goes faster than its natural rate of falling but the furniture with our noble selves would go on falling at their old pace and would therefore be left behind practically we should rise to the ceiling said the earl the inevitable result of which would be concussion of brain to avoid that said arthur let us have the furniture fixed to the floor and ourselves tied down to the furniture then the five o'clock tea could go on in peace with one little drawback lady muriel gaily interrupted we should take the cups down with us but what about the tea i had forgotten the tea arthur confessed 
that no doubt would rise to the ceiling unless you chose to drink it on the way which i think is quite nonsense enough for one while said the earl what news does this gentleman bring us from the great world of london this drew me into the conversation which now took a more conventional tone after a while arthur gave the signal for our departure and in the cool of the evening we strolled down to the beach enjoying the silence broken only by the murmur of the sea and the faraway music of some fisherman's song almost as much as our late pleasant talk we sat down among the rocks by a little pool so rich in animal vegetable and zoophytic or whatever is the right word life that i became entranced in the study of it and when arthur proposed returning to our lodgings i begged to be left there for a while to watch and muse alone the fisherman's song grew ever nearer and clearer as their boat stood in for the beach and i would have gone down to see them land their cargo of fish had not the microcosm at my feet stirred my curiosity yet more keenly one ancient crab that was for ever shuffling frantically from side to side of the pool had particularly fascinated me there was a vacancy in its stare and an aimless violence in its behaviour that irresistibly recalled the gardener who had befriended sylvie and bruno and as i gazed i caught the concluding notes of the tune of his crazy song the silence that followed was broken by the sweet voice of sylvie would you please let us out into the road what after that old beggar again the gardener yelled and began singing he thought he saw a kangaroo that worked the coffee mill he looked again and found it was a vegetable pill but i to swallow this he said i should be very ill we don't want him to swallow anything sylvie explained he's not hungry but we want to see him so will you please certainly the gardener promptly replied i always please never displeases nobody there you are and he flung the door open and let us out upon the dusty high road we soon found our way to the bush which had so mysteriously sunk into the ground, and here Sylvie drew the magic locket from its hiding place, turned it over with a thoughtful air, and at last appealed to Bruno in a rather helpless way. What was it we had to do with it, Bruno? It's all gone out of my head. Kiss it, was Bruno's invariable recipe in cases of doubt and difficulty. Sylvie kissed it, but no result followed. Rub it the wrong way was bruno's next suggestion which is the wrong way sylvie most reasonably inquired the obvious plan was to try both ways rubbing it from left to right had no visible effect whatever from right to left oh stop sylvie bruno cried in sudden alarm whatever's going to happen for a number of trees on the neighbouring hillside were moving slowly upwards in solemn procession, while a mild little brook that had been rippling at our feet a moment before began to swell and foam and hiss and bubble in a truly alarming fashion. "'Rub it some other way!' cried Bruno. "'Troy up and down, quick!' It was a happy thought. Up and down did it, and the landscape, which had been showing signs of mental aberration in various directions, returned to its normal condition of sobriety with the exception of a small yellowish-brown mouse, which continued to run wildly up and down the road, lashing its tail like a little lion. "'Let's follow it,' said Sylvie. And this also turned out a happy thought. The mouse at once settled down into a business-like jog-trot with which we could easily keep pace. The only phenomena that gave me any uneasiness was the rapid increase in the size of the little creature we were following, which became every moment more and more like a real lion. Soon the transformation was complete, and a noble lion stood patiently waiting for us to come up with it no thought of fear seemed to occur to the children who patted and stroked it as if it had been a shetland pony help me up cried bruno and in another moment sylvie had lifted him upon the broad back of the gentle beast and seated herself behind him pillion fashion bruno took a good handful of mane in each hand and made believe to guide this new kind of steed Gee up 
seemed quite sufficient by way of verbal direction the lion at once broke into an easy canter and we soon found ourselves in the depths of the forest i say we for i am certain that i accompanied them though how i managed to keep up with the cantering lion i am wholly unable to explain but i was certainly one of the party when we came upon an old beggar man cutting sticks at whose feet the lion made a profound obeisance sylvie and bruno at the same moment dismounting and leaping into the arms of their father from bad to worse the old man said to himself dreamily when the children had finished their rather confused account of the ambassador's visit gathered no doubt from general report as they had not seen him themselves from bad to worse that is their destiny i see it but i cannot alter it the selfishness of a mean and crafty man the selfishness of an ambitious and silly woman the selfishness of a spiteful and loveless child all tend one way from bad to worse and you my darlings must suffer it a while i fear yet when things are at their worst you can come to me i can do but little as yet gathering up a handful of dust and scattering it into the air he slowly and solemnly pronounced some words that sounded like a charm the children looking on in awestruck silence let craft ambition spite be quenched in reason's night till weakness turn to might till what is dark be light till what is wrong be right the cloud of dust spread itself out through the air as if it were alive forming curious shapes that were for ever changing into others it makes letters it makes words bruno whispered as he clung half frightened to sylvie oh i can't make them out read them sylvie i'll try sylvie gravely replied wait a minute if only i could see that word i should be very ill a discordant voice yelled in our ears were i to swallow this he said i should be very ill <laughs> end of chapter eight